Today, the second Sunday of our Lenten journey, year B, you see, Jesus again presents to us another place of prayer. On the first Sunday of Lent, he shows us the desert as a place we can encounter God when things no longer work well in our lives. Today, he leads us to the mountain. The mountain as a place of prayer has always been an important place for the people of Israel, for the children of God in totality. I remember when the hurricane started in America and I was watching on the television the narrative of the local Indies, how they survived. One of them was sharing the experience. They say, how come all of you survived? And this man narrated his experience by saying that he observed that the ants that stays beneath the surface of the soil started coming out and all of them were going upwards towards the mountain. As he observed it, he knew that something was wrong from beneath. So he called and triggered the alarm and all of them, they ran up the mountain. As they were going up the mountain, the modern child looked at the local Indians and were making fun of them. That how can you be looking at ants? That you get your inspiration from ants. They were the ones that told the story because they were the only ones that survived. They say, in times of trouble, run up to the mountain. Why did our forefathers tell us to run up to the mountain? Because in Isaiah chapter 25 verse 6, it is written that on this mountain, the Lord of hosts shall prepare for all people a feast of rich food and choices wine. On the mountain, God feeds his people. If you read in verse 7, he says, the Lord will destroy all the power cast over the people. God will wipe away our tears. On the mountain, God wipes away the tears of his children. Every time you are worried, once you rise above mediocrity, you rise above the problems of this life, God wipes your tears. On this mountain, I will wipe your tears. If you read Exodus chapter 17 verse 10, it was on the mountain that God told Moses to climb and as far as his hands were up, victory was assured. On the mountain, God grants victory to his children. When the human person is elevated and his hands is up, he attains victory. Because from the beginning of creation, God has created the human person to increase. It was Jesus who held the hands of his apostles and led them up. When Moses was weak in life, he was supported by his friends. Who is holding your hands today? Who is leading you up the mountain? Who is doing this journey with you? The people you put around you can be a source of strength. Or they can be the source of your downfall in life. Who are those leading you? Jesus led Peter, James, and John up the mountain. And on top of the mountain, he was transfigured. They saw another Jesus. And we get to that point. It was on the mountain that God gave Moses the law that would eventually become the guide for his children. Exodus chapter 20 verse 2. Even Deuteronomy chapter 5 verse 6. On the mountain, God guides his own and ensures that they do not go astray in life. Where do you get your guidance from? Do you allow God to lead you? When the human person transcends, he sees things from a different level. Are you on the valley? Are you already down? You know, our people will say, eh, he who is on the floor fears no fall. But I say to you, my dear friend, the minute you are lying down in mediocrity, the minute you are lying down in that fall, you can never get to your destination. 
It's better slow and steady we win the race. Even though I believe speed and accuracy stands a better chance. Never lie. Never give up in life. Every step you take must lead you to greater height. As such, the mountain becomes a place of prayer. In praying, therefore, I want to just look at one aspect of prayer. Prayer as a union with God. Let me begin with our human experience of union. Among all the relationships that human beings have, the relationship between a mother and a child, the deepened friendship, even organ or blood donor to the receiver, only the relationship between spouses is, is called a union. Nobody calls the, the, the relationship between mother and child a union. A donor and a receiver a union. The only one I've observed that people normally call a union is the one that exists between couples. No other relationship matches the complete oneness of mind, body, and life that a marital union accomplishes. My point is that not even the union of husband and wife captures the union that exists in prayer. In marriage, there are two unique, equal, and mutual, independent persons. In prayer too, there are two unique persons, God and me, but we are unequal, unequal partners. God is God and I am a creature. And the dependence is one-sided. My dependence is, my existence is dependent on God. But God's existence is not dependent on me. But this inequality between God and me does not rob me of my dignity. The inequality is made up by the unconditional love, fidelity, mercy, kindness, and graciousness of God. Perhaps prayer happens when a completely dependent me and an unconditionally kind and gracious God become one. Prayer happens when a completely dependent me and an unconditionally kind and gracious God become one. That is union. While I am on earth, every attempt I make in word and in deed to achieve this union is what we call prayer. To be one with God. The lifting, they say, prayer is the lifting up of the heart and mind to God. But the best prayers like meditation, contemplation is what? The human person becoming one. You have so prayed that you and God become one. This one that takes place in different places. Like in the Eucharist, for instance. You know, Fuebag understands this when he says, every human being, you are what you eat. The minute you receive the Eucharist, you become the Eucharist you receive. Because every human being is a product of what he or she eats. You see, the, the plant gets their nutrients from the soil and transforms the nutrients into plants. Goats will graze on grass and transform the grass into goat. Human being will eat goat and transform the goat into human being. Uh -huh. Because in simple science, they say the higher organisms in life assimilate the lower organisms and transform the lower organisms into the higher organisms that they have received. If I eat Ishiya Wu, for instance, if you bisect me, you can't see the head of goat again. I have absorbed the goat and upgraded the goat into me. So you are what you eat. That's why I don't drink things like small stouts. When you eat black amala, you'll be black. You are what you eat. The minute I receive Jesus, Jesus is the higher one. Even though I'm the one receiving it. What? The principle still stands. Jesus absorbs everything about me and transforms it into himself. That has, so he upgrades me. So the minute I receive Jesus, I become another Jesus. And this is exactly what happens in prayer. The minute I come close to God, God absorbs me. And that's why St. Paul, and in the scripture he said, It is no longer I who live, 
But the Jesus that lives in me, the more I pray, the more I get closer to God, the more I become the, uh, like the God I pray to. As I earlier said, that in marital union, there are two persons who are unique, equal, mutual interdependence. In the union with God, when I reach the end of my life, I shall be ready to lose my identity, my life, my uniqueness. Indeed, my entire life in complete union with God. That day, there will no longer be me, but only God. This is when prayer is complete. This is when we say it's a perfect prayer. When I become God, like John will say, we do not know what God looks like. All we know is that when we get there, we shall be like him. That is perfect prayer. The marriage of the Lamb. And this is all that the scripture draws our attention to. And that's why taking Peter, James, and John up the mountain, he transformed everything about their ideology. Prayer therefore transforms us. There are five principles of recreation in life. Every human being who wants to become a new person, who wants to change, must first start with his prayer life. In 1 Chronicles chapter 4, verse 9 to 10, a story was told about a man who was called Jabez. Jabez, his name brought a lot of bad luck to him. They said this man prayed. He prayed to God. And by praying, God was able to change the name. And change his path for him. Prayer changes a lot of things. Because in prayer the human mind is recollected. The human mind now begins to understand the will of God. And aligns himself to that will of God. And it is when one accepts the will of God in his life. He struggles less. And he keeps his perspective and his focus on his destiny. You know I heard one thing in Yoruba. They say. Aimasiko londa mweda. Like, we don't know the time. We don't know when things will take place. We don't know what God has for us. And this is the basis of our confusion in life. The minute I pray, I understand the mind of God. It helps me in the second principle, which is persistency. In John chapter 5 verse 10, there was a story told about a man who has been sick for 38 years. But he knew that the source of his cure was in the pool. And for that 38 years, this man will not depart from the side of the pool. Because he knew that no other way, place will he get well. What about each and every one of us? When the problems of this life come, are we persistent? Are we consistent in our choice of staying with God? Little wonder, therefore, you can hear all over the world, all over the society, the amount of ritual is getting on the increase. Why? Because people are no longer sure of anything. Life is all about try your luck. Listen, my dear friend. Satan can give you a house. Satan can give you a wife. Satan can give you money. But Satan can never give you a cross. Because beyond the cross lies the salvation of the human person. When Satan gives you with one hand, he collects. He puts condition. But God gives unreservedly. In fact, God loved us even when we did not even realize it. So, on a day like this, by taking the apostles up the mountain, he transforms their life. Because the minute you understand God in prayer and you are persistent in holding him, Even in Luke chapter 18 verse 1, Jesus would teach his disciples never to be discouraged. Everything that happens to you has my mark on it. If God is removing something from your hands, it's because he wants this hand to be free so that he can put another thing. The problem is when a door closes, instead of us to look at the other opportunities that have opened, we spend all our life looking and analyzing the door that has been closed. But we are taught over and over, don't cry over a spilt milk. Keep going. And that's why I used to like that signage. No stopping, no waiting. Keep moving. Whatever has happened, learn from it. Learn from the experience. Let it strengthen you and keep going. 
Our fathers say, whatever does not kill you in this life will only make you strong. And there's nothing the eyes will see that will make it to shed blood. Like the Igbo will say, nothing the eyes will see. Everything you experience in life will only help you to become a better person. The minute I pray, I am persistent in my prayer. Then it will lead to the third principle, which is conviction. In Job chapter 19, verse 25, Job says, I know my redeemer live it. John, in Daniel chapter 3, even when the three children, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, were facing difficulties, they said to themselves, we will worship no other God except the God of Yahweh. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 1, he will say, I come against you in the name of God. The prophet will say in 2 Kings chapter 6, one with God is majority. When they were faced with danger, they had nowhere to go. They turned to God in prayer. And God opened the cloud. And the minute they saw the angels, they said, those on our side are greater than those on their side. Conviction. By taking them up the mountain, they will be convinced that they are worshipping the right God for the rest of their lives. Then people will ask, why is it that we have a lot of dullness? Why do young people don't feel the impulse in the church? Why do they always complain? It's because they don't understand a lot of things. They are not convinced about what they are doing. They are not even sure about the Jesus they are following. Jesus today for many is, is, is one among plenty. He's not different from Confucius and others. And little wonder you hear somebody will say, I am Jesus of Onyigo. Guru Maharaji will say, eh, the kingdom of God on earth. Because God is just one among many. It's just an ideology for some. Are you convinced about the God you are serving? Do you understand the difference between the mass? Service. I still hear Catholics, they come to church on Sunday, they say, Father, I went for service. Do you know the difference between a service and a mass? A crusade. A revival. The minute you don't understand the differences, you can't understand what you are doing. And that's why you think all of them are the same. Mass is a sacrifice. It's a sacrifice that purifies us. That makes us to reenact. The situation of the cross is different from service. Service does not have a sacrifice. I keep telling people, see, if you want to understand mass well, let me say you have committed a crime in your village. Maybe you were caught doing something with another person. They now said, according to Edo culture, when a man or a woman is caught misbehaving with another person and she needs to go through the purification rite, they say she's going to be naked. She will carry her goat and go around the market seven times in the hot afternoon, 12 o'clock. Imagine they now tell you a full-blown human being in Lagos now, after all the shakara and the makeup you have done, they now say you'll be naked in the afternoon. You now go to Balogu Market, carry he goat, and go around the market seven times. You, you think you'll be laughing? That is sacrifice. When you are expiating your sin, you are paying for something. You don't laugh. It's different from when we travel to the village. Then all of us, we gather at the center of our market square. And we are dancing. The, the, the Egungu is playing the dancing. He's dancing. Even when Egungu is playing, there, there is one thing I used to say, Egungu, be careful. You are going to the express. There is time for everything. Even when we are dancing, dances has got different classes and different grades and different types. When you are dancing samba, it's different from when you are dancing a willow. I hope you know. All of them are danced, but they are different. If you are dancing samba to a willow, everybody will be looking at you. Or you are using rhythm and blues to dance a willow. They will be looking at you whether you are normal. And that is how it is even in the religion. The mass is different from the service. And it's different from crusade. And it's different from revival. You must know which one you are going. Because many people come to church and they say the church is dull. Which sacrifice in life is, is interesting? Even in our native parlance, 
The minute you are entering the spirit kingdom, they will tell you, put leave, palm leave on your mouth. Don't talk. You will be going as you are entering the evil forest. You are shaking. Who dances? Mass as a sacrifice. Are you convinced about the God you are serving? I know my God, leave it. Good or bad, I will choose not to serve any other person apart from God. There are many Christians that are not convinced. Because in growing up, we learned about Superman. You know, as a little child, when you come to a boarding house, and you want to know all those children who have spent all their life watching cartoon, they will tell you that in the school, by 10 o'clock, all lights out, all children go to bed. You don't talk again. In the morning, rising, maybe 5.30, you will just be sleeping as a senior. You will just hear one tiny voice. hoo Superman has woken up. Hoo-hoo. He's spreading his bread. You will just throw. And you are like, who is doing that one? He said, let's go, Spider-Man. He will just jump from his bed. Bagam. Carry his bucket. He will tell his friend to take the bucket down that he will meet him downstairs. He will not tie uh, the b- blanket on his neck and say, Superman is going to the bathroom. He will jump from first floor down because he thinks he's Spider-Man. By the time he lands on the floor and the leg snaps and he begins to cry, they will now rush him to the hospital. And everybody's wondering, how can somebody jump from first floor? He said, I thought I was Spider-Man. Then in the hospital, when they put POP on his neck, plaster of Paris, and they are giving him the injection, it will now help to reset his head to know that he, he Spider does not have man. I mean, do you know the gender of Spider-Man? He now begins to change. As he's growing, he drops all those ideas. He now begins to understand that these things are friction. There are times too we think the stories we have read in the Bible is friction. Because we read that Jesus was going, he saw a group of people, he saw one blind man, he would just put spit on the floor, put clay, touch the eye, the thing will open. He will touch one person, bam, spirit will go away. We have prayed, prayed, put spit. If I even put spit on the floor, they will be checking, Father, are you okay? As we are growing, we begin to share those ideas because we don't have that complete encounter of the one we have chosen. Without this encounter with God, the human person in no time will dissolve. The minute I have this prayer life and I'm persistent in it and I'm convinced, it will lead to a commitment and consecration of the human person. In 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 10, When Anna encountered God and she was persistent in her prayer and she was convinced that there is no other way and no other name under which the surface of the earth that a human person will be saved other than God. The minute God fulfilled his own part, Anna was committed to fulfill her own part. He returned the child back to God. Those who know God are committed. Your time, your treasure, your talent. What are you using at the service of humanity? Who you are is a gift of God to you. What you become now is your gift back to God. That God has spared your life. That God has helped you. In the midst, like I was telling somebody, no matter how hungry you are, you are still better than 1,000 persons out there. Like there's something I used to console myself in those days in school. You know, if we are 40 in the class and the result is out, somebody now comes back home with 39 out of 40. When we look at the result, you say, ah, you were almost last. You were almost last means therefore that you are even not the last. Thank God that at least you passed one person. Uh-huh. The person that carried last, what would that one now say? At least you are better than one person. The one that does not have shoe will be complaining, Father, I don't have shoe, I don't have shoe. What will the one that don't have leg complain about? Without contentment, the human person cannot be satisfied. Do you know that there are times people will be walking on the leg, you see somebody with bicycle or okada, you say, ha, ha, we shall have okada. The one that has okada is praying that, ha, ha, we shall have a car. The one that has a car is praying, ha, we shall have plane. Do you know that pilots are still complaining? That they want better jobs. 
And I'm asking, you're already in the sky. And you want a better job. Okay, we say, okay, astronaut, you begin to go space. Do you know that even those who are going space, entering the space, they are still praying for a better job? Where again? You have gone out. Where again you want to go? Everybody prays for a better job. But do you know that that job you are doing, some other person is praying to have it? That is better job for the human person. And this is how life is. To be committed. To learn to play your part in life. The minute the apostles were convinced about God, for the rest of their life, they followed Jesus wholeheartedly. They left everything to ensure that humanity feel the impulse of God. The river flows in the temple. And wherever the river flows, it brings life to it. And this is the fifth principle, the prophetic declaration. The minute you know God and you are convinced about the God, that prophetic aspect of you begins to come out. In Ezekiel chapter 37, he said, can this dry bone rise again? Man of God, can it rise? He said, yes. Dry bones can rise again. The minute you are a child of God, you know the God you are following. Nothing, you can never give up trying in life. Suicide is not an option for you. Because as God liveth, you know that your story is not going to end in disastrous ways. You may not be rich in material things, but you can be rich with peace of mind. You can be rich in love. You can be rich in compassion. I remember those days, there are some students, very brilliant. Before teacher will even finish teaching self, they know the answer. I stopped disturbing myself. The day Archbishop Job said, a brilliant student is one that knows the answer to the problem. He now added, a brilliant student also is one that knows where to find the answer. Ah, as I heard that, I stopped disturbing myself. I know where to find the answer, even if I don't know the answer. Eh, it makes me still brilliant now. Nah? Whether you have A1 or you have A3, when they ask you, how many A's do you have? You say, I have seven A's. Whether A1 or A3 is still A, Prophetic declaration, my dear friend. In Numbers chapter 6, verse 22. This is how you will call down blessings on my people. Do you speak and things happen? Remember who you are. It's only through prayer, the anointing in you that can make things happen. The more the grace in you, the more the favor of the Lord follows wherever you go. And the more you find that favor in the midst of your brothers and your sisters. Think, my dear friends, there are many things we can do. By raising the apostles and taking them up the mountain, their lives were never the same again. You can find all those principles in their life. And they would decree the word and it will come to pass. Remember, every time you come to church, you are coming to the sanctuary of the Lord. And from the sanctuary of the Lord, the river flows. And wherever it goes, it gives life. You are the river of God in existence. Never forget that. Wherever you go, you bring life to that path. Each time people say, Father, life is boring. I say, it's because you are a boring human being. You are not living to full capability. You are the happiness itself. They say, Father, love does not exist. I say, because you are not in existence. You don't believe in yourself. You are love personified. You have forgotten that you are a product of love. You were born out of love. The love a man has for a woman. And you are the symbol of the love of God in existence. So you are love personified. So how can you say love does not exist? If every human being is love personified. If they say love is not well. It means we are not living well. That's just a simple truth. So strive hard. The minute you have, there will be seven things that will appear in your life. Walking with the divine spirit will help you to regenerate it. Ability, that's why at the end of the, 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 the transfiguration, he said, listen to my son. Who do you listen to in our words today? I was hearing, uh, I was listening to one clip on the video. They say if you go to Itri or you go to a uh, bar and you hear people saying, this is Spain, this is Morocco, this is Spain, this is Morocco. And they start that conversation. 
the person talking say change your table change your table immediately when they tell you say nigeria and bene look at it in the map nigeria is not far from bene therefore morocco and spain is not far you see that small line that small water you are seeing it is not as small as it's drawn in the map oh is a big river it's not canoe that can cross it a lot of people have lost their life because of sea spain sea morocco sea spain sea morocco don't listen to them it's not like that who are you listening to my dear friend do you listen to the word of god the minute you begin to listen to the word of God and God takes possession of you, you are going to have the spirit of sharing. John chapter 6 verse 5 to 13. The little boy brought out the five loaves and they had the two fish and they could share. If the spirit of the Lord does not dwell in you, the way you are supposed to activate it, you can't even share anything with your business partner. And that's why greed overwhelms a lot of things. The resources that is supposed to be enough for everybody is no longer enough because people are no longer willing to share. You see, prayer can help us. Up the mountain can help us to reset our heart. Receiving from the sanctuary We help us to have the fear of the Lord. We have lost the sense of the sacred because the minute the apostles went up the mountain, you see, they were struck with this awe. The fear of God in their hearts. In those days, our parents would tell us, anywhere there is church, before you come in 10 meters to the church, you stop talking and begin to focus. You come early to mass and you prepare yourself, you integrate yourself to that sacrifice. Add your intention to the intentions of the mass. I was shocked. One day, I was not celebrating mass and I took a stroll to see how parishioners are faring. Only for me as I was going, I now met a group of people on the road. They were singing carrying hymn book and singing i said which one is this one they say they know they are late they are doing entrance hymn that they have already read the reading in their house so for you mass is like cut and join you just cut you attend when you come you attend the first part then you you wait for the second part to receive communion before they finish prayer before communion you, you are the one at the bus stop the fear of god the minute you have this fear of God, it will lead to the service of God. And the service of God will open up that generosity in us. Then you learn to sow in the right place. Psalm 1 verse 1 to 3 say, He shall bear fruit in season and out of season. The minute you know God and you are elevated, you bear fruit in season and out of season. There are too many people sowing seed in the wrong places today. They leave the comfort of their zone to enter into a bush, to thinking that by doing ritual, by killing their brothers and their sisters, their life will be better. It's not true. Experience have shown, history has testified, that it is only when we keep our focus, do your work well, God blesses the work of your hands. Above all, never forget, sometimes in life, everything good may not always come your way. If God knows that those good things of life will lead you astray, he may deliberately not bring you to your path. I end with this analysis. The human person will work so hard. Fly, fly, will not walk. The minute you sit down, you buy drink so that you enjoy the fruit of your labor. Fly will perceive the aroma, the, the sweet smell of the drink. He will not come. Instead of fly, to drink small because it will not work. Drink small and go. What will fly do? Drink, 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 and do what? And die there. Some of us behave like fly. You want to reap where you have not sown. Think, my dear friend, God does not want us to behave like flies. He wants us to be his children. By being his children, he leads us. If you allow God to lead you, you will always lead you to the right places. I pray on a day like this, no matter what society throws at us, May we learn to make good use of these places that God has shown us that we can have this encounter with God. And may the encounter we have with God transform our lives positively through Christ our Lord.